So thanks for the invitation. I talk about the UNESCO Convention on Cultural Diversity, its history and significance for trade agreements. Some 15 years ago, I, being an artist by profession, got involved in the process of shaping an international treaty with a very clumsy title, the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Around the turn of the millennium, of course, we didn't even know that UNESCO would host the document we fought for, nor did we have much reason to believe it would ever come true. I'm an Austrian novelist and poet. As a freelancer, I have to, and definitely want to, focus on my literary work. But I know very well that artistic production needs a structural framework, facilitating a healthy environment in order to be able to earn a living, provided that what you do finds an audience. That is why I became a member of the board of the Austrian Writers' Association. In the late 90s, I was asked by fellow members of the board to take over responsibility for European and international relations. Due to the growing influence of supranational structures on cultural policies, in the early days of neoliberal deregulation, the association found it necessary to be vigilant and get involved in civil society activities against MAI <coughs> and further gas steps. In those days, most European artists still felt comfortable in what I would later call the subsidiarity trap. They thought that there was a clear distinction between policy fields and the national sovereignty and others subject to EU legislation or global treaties. For obvious reasons, it had been agreed that the European integration should not include art and culture. The principle of subsidiarity should safeguard cultural diversity and was welcomed by a vast majority of artists and cultural workers. Far from promoting nationalist approaches and provincialism, there were rational and emotional reasons for keeping up national sovereignty in these fields. Austria, for example, just like quite a few other European countries, has had a long tradition of a so-called Kulturstaat, a state that promotes and protects culture and art by subsidies, for instance, national film funding, legislation, for instance, fixed book prices, and the structural environment from art education at school to public libraries, public theatres like the Vienna State Opera and so forth. The first night of an important production at the Court Theatre in Vienna or the Salzburg Festival is still a topic of the main evening news on TV in my country as is the new novel of a renowned writer. It all began with the General Agreement, agreement on, trade, on Trade and Services, GATS, entering into force in 1995, almost unnoticed by the artists and cultural, cultural professionals in Austria. The country had liberalized certain printing and publishing services, entertainment services, and even libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural services. The confiden confidential, or should I say clandestine, negotiations of a multilateral agreement on investment, MAI, starting in 1995, became an important topic only in 1997, when a draft of the agreement was leaked. This MAI attempt to establish a global framework for a radical free market economy aimed at minimizing the diverse state regulations in governing the conditions under which investments by foreign corporations could take place. It finally failed to a certain degree because of the pressure of many of the then emerging NGOs. France was the first country to withdraw, others followed. Since then, other acronyms like TISA or TTIP have replaced MAI, 
on bilateral, plurilateral, and multilateral levels, all these negotiations have had similar goals. According to the WTO logic and that of certain governments, we all know it, culture and art should be treated like ordinary goods and services in free trade negotiation contexts. And worst of all, there was no legal instrument to rely on if states wanted a cultural exemption. Only gradually, the concerned public became aware that cultural subsidiarity in the globalized post-Cold War world ended when economy came into play. The effects on established structures would have been dramatic if subsidies, quota, and laws in support of art and culture had been considered mere violations of competition. Abolishment or open access for individuals and enterprises from all signatory parties to a treaty would have been the consequence. Little wonder that countries like France with its strong cultural sector or Canada with a, long with a long tradition of supporting cultural diversity and the US in the neighborhood were in the lead to develop a successful strategy due to the efforts of Sheila Copps, then Minister of Canadian Heritage, the International Network on Cultural Policy, INCP, was founded. The idea was to strengthen culture ministers on a global scale by joining together. In their governments, they usually have a weak pro position, a strong network of culture ministers, however, could form an influential lobby for an alternative treatment of cultural goods and services for a legal tool to exclude culture and art from trade negotiations if, of course, if states or supranational structures like the EU considered that worthwhile. At the same time, cultural NGOs and activists form two global networks for the same purpose, the INCD, International Network for Cultural Diversity, which met on an annual basis where the INCP met. Soon an exchange of ideas and strategies was established. The other NGO, Sigolin talked about it and is a representative of that organization, was the Coalition for Cultural Diversity with emerging branches in many countries. Both organizations had their origin in Canada and were considerably funded by interested governments which considered it necessary to join forces with civil society. I became an INCD board member and was soon contracted by the Austrian Ministry for Art and Culture to change sides. As a member of the Austrian delegation at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, I worked regularly as an advisor in the process of shaping the convention in many INCP meetings I took part on behalf of my minister. The INCD and the coalitions did a marvelous job and influenced the final text of the convention a lot. The INCD even presented their own draft of a convention and it is not so much the contents that make a difference compared to the adopted text, but the binding character of the provisions. While the INCD suggested clear obligations of the signatory parties, the final text resorted to vague wordings like parties may take all appropriate measures or developed countries shall facilitate. Despite all disappointments, however, the document is a major step to counter the desires of radical free trade lobbies. Among the artists, organizations that cooperated intensely with the coalitions and the INCD were many national artists' councils and the European Council of Artists, ECA, an umbrella of umbrellas, strongly supported by the Danish colleagues and soon neglected by the European Union that has little interest in a functioning representation of artists in Europe, although many decisions that severely affect us are taken in Brussels. As a former ECA president, I do regret the deterioration of this organization due to lack of financial resources. Anyway, in 2005, the convention process came to an end and the final text was adopted and when the necessary quorum of signatory parties was reached, in 2007, the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions came into effect. Today, three quarters of the states on this planet have ratified this document of international law. 
Despite the fact that UNESCO only consists of member states, it was made possible that the European Union as such also ratified the Convention text. The Convention defines the distinct nature of cultural goods and services as vehicles of values, identity and meaning. It is this distinction from other goods and services that gives the signatory parties options to insist on a kind of cultural exemption in trade negotiations, a cultural exemption that will be dealt with, or that was dealt with uh, by, by uh, Ségolène before. Signatory parties like the EU and its member states now have a functioning tool in their hands, but strong lobbies want them not to make use of it. According to Article 6, measures to prote protect and promote cultural diversity may include, and I quote, regulatory measures aimed at protecting and promoting diversity of cultural expressions, measures that in an appropriate manner provide opportunities for domestic cultural activities, goods and services among all those available within the national territory for the creation, production, dissemination, distribution and enjoyment of such domestic cultural activities, goods and services, including provisions relating to the language use. <coughs> Measures aimed at providing domestic independent cultural industries and activities in the informal sector effective ac access to the means of production, dissemination and distribution of cultural activities, goods and services. Measures aimed at providing public financial assistance. Measures aimed at encouraging non-profit organizations as well as public and private institutions and artists and other cultural professionals to develop and promote the free exchange and circulation of ideas, cultural expressions and cultural activities, goods and services and to stimulate both the creative and entrepreneurial spirit in their activities. Measures aimed at establishing and supporting public institutions as appropriate. Measures aimed at nurturing and supporting artists and others involved in the creation of cultural expressions. Measures aimed at enhancing diversity of the media, including through public service broadcasting. It is our huge task to convince our national parliaments not to agree to any commitments in trade negotiations like TTIP that would make any of these measures illegal, as TTIP would not only affect EU regulations but also national laws, the parliaments in the member states will have a decisive role in that process. I think that a meeting like this is the right place to underline at least two more central objectives of the Convention clearly related to negotiations like the TTIP process, although at first sight this seems a little far-fetched. For the first time ever, a document of international law includes an article that pays tribute to civil society in a way that NGOs are invited to actively contribute to all relevant developments concerning the provisions of the Convention. Article 11 reads, and I quote, Parties acknowledge the fundamental role of civil society in protecting and promoting the diversity of cultural expressions. Parties shall encourage the active participation of civil society in their efforts to achieve the objectives of the Convention. As a cultural exemption in the TTIP context clearly protects, and we have talked about the cultural exemption, exist, non-existence or existence, in, as a cultural exemption in the TTIP context clearly protects and promotes the diversity of cultural expressions in Europe, the secrecy of the negotiations is in my mind, or in my mind clearly contradicts Article 11 of that convention. Cultural NGOs, like the National Councils of Artists, should therefore make use of this article when demanding transparency, we talked about it, and their recognition as organizations whose positions should be taken into consideration by way of consulting civil society on national and European levels. 
I would also like to draw your attention to Article 16 with the following wording. Developed countries, and I quote, shall facilitate cultural exchanges with developing countries by granting, through the appropriate institutional and legal frameworks, preferential treatment to artists and other cultural professionals and practitioners, as well as cultural goods and services from developing countries. It is a shame that a growing number of artists from the South, musicians, actors, writers, visual artists, and so on, do not get visa to enter the European Union, be it under the regime of the EU visa code for Schengen member countries or according to national law, even if all formal requirements are fulfilled. They have contracts, get paid, return flights are booked in advance, but the embassies deny entrance to the fortress Europe. These colleagues often have to travel extensively within their own home country or even abroad to the nearest embassy. If a document is missing, they have to come back in persona only to find out that, for instance, Austria is not convinced that the applicant is rooted deeply enough in his home country to be allowed to enter the Schengen area. It is a shame, as I pointed out before, that every effort is taken to secure the free flow of cultural goods and services on a global scale, but at the same time, artists from the South have to cope with severe problems to come here in order to present their work and receive support and appreciation for their art, as well as for their struggle, sometimes under hardly bearable conditions. Only recently, a company of 15 handicapped Afghan actors invited to a renowned theatre festival in Salzburg, who had travelled to Pakistan to apply for Schengen visa many months before the event, were denied travel documents shortly before departure. Part of the scandal is the loss of more than 11,000 euro of taxpayers' money for flight tickets, a prerequisite for the visa application. Not even the subsidies from the regional government could convince the Austrian embassy to revise their position. The UNESCO Convention on Cultural Diversity, however, demands preferential treatment to artists and cultural professionals. It took a long time and many protests as well as proposals by civil society but these days, the EU consultation process on the issue is underway. I advise all present artists' council to contribute to that consultation if you have not done so far. If you have not done so, so far. The measures under discussion would be a major step to improve the possibility of artists from the South to enter Europe and fulfill contracts, get trained, start cultural dialogue. They must come into effect and force, EU members, and force EU member states to adapt their codes of practice. I am convinced without the Convention on Cultural Diversity, a development like this would not have been possible in this climate of growing hysteria and xenophobia. Cultural exchange, however, is one of the few reasonable means to fight the resurrection of hollow nationalism in a world of uncertainty and depression. As I would like to leave some time for discussion and questions, I finish here. Let me just add the final remark that we in Austria have succeeded in establishing a very effective contact point for the Convention at UNESCO that keeps us updated and accompanies our activities with remarkable commitment. <coughs> At this point of time, for example, the contact point coordinates all statements in the consultation process concerning artists' mobility I refer to. I myself am the chairman of the UNESCO Consulting Committee for Cultural Diversity that gathers representatives of the various ministries in charge and independent experts around one table. This way we have at least achieved some progress in fields with a national scope lift and secured that our proposals and initiatives have been taken into consideration 
and sometimes